So, um, now Christmas coming up, y'all are going to go to a lot of Christmas parties, and you're going to play a game that's called Dirty Santa. What, can we rethink the name? (laughs) It sounds kind of naughty, Dirty Santa, but we know what this game is, right? You all bring a little thing, a little gift, pre-wrapped, and you know, you, you, you take it and you open it, and other people see what you got, and then you're like, oh, I want that, I'm going to steal it from you, and then somebody might steal yours, and on and on it goes, until the last person gets the pick of the litter, right? And they can get the best thing that no, everyone else wanted. Well, many years ago, I went to one of those, and they did a twist on it where you couldn't open it until the very end, and everybody opened their gifts at the same time, okay? And so you had to do it sight unseen. And so someone wrapped this huge rectangle. It was heavy and it was big. And everyone wanted it because of it's just, it was bigger than everybody else's. And so people are cheating each other. They're, I mean, husbands and wives are turning on each other. Uh, family members, they all want the big thing. And till finally the end, it comes around. Everyone starts opening all of their gifts, and this person that fought so hard for the giant rectangle opened this, a, box, a bag of cedar chips. <laughs> so if you had a hamster or a bird or a chicken, hey, it saved you 10 bucks. So <laughs> the person who opened the cedar chips was a little bit disappointed. It was a pretty amazing, actually, idea, so you can feel free to use that this year. But imagine that the opposite was true. Imagine if you opened a gift like that and it was a box of cash or a plane ticket to Aruba or something or 10 PS5s all crammed together or a bunch of iPhone 15s or whatever. Imagine if it was some incredible gift and you were like, here, I wanted to give that to you this Christmas. And the person you gave it to was just didn't even thank you. They just sort of left the room, right? Now, obviously, that would make you feel kind of jilted, kind of hurt. Um, you know, a lot of times maybe you have reached out in concern to others. You have offered a, a word of encouragement or uh, you've tried to console someone or you tried to help someone on the street and they didn't return the love. We've all been there. And it kind of hurts. It kind of hurts your feelings. Like, well, I won't, hurt, I won't help you. I won't. I, well, I wasted my time. We, we've all been there. We've all felt that. And it hurts because you care, right? And you got ignored. But see, here's the thing about offering healing to others or offering grace to others or offering love to anyone is that it's a risk, right? Because you're never guaranteed that it's going to be reciprocated back, that it's going to be returned in in due time. There's really no guarantee. So it's always an act of faith to love or to serve or to to offer healing to someone else. But you should be encouraged because it's not really up to you how it's received, right? It's like you're scattering a seed. It's not up to you what they do with it. The fact that you did it at all, God saw it. God noticed. He knows. And as Jesus says, if you do your good deeds in secret, you will reap a reward in in heaven one day for the Father sees in secret. So we should give without expectation of acknowledgement. This is what Jesus repeatedly did. He constantly was healing and helping people. And not all of them said thank you. Maybe they didn't go to Cotillion like some of us did in the South. I mean, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus teaches this. You have heard the law that says punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, and probably more, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. And do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. And also in Luke chapter 6, love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you'll be children of the Most High. For he is kind to who? All the nice people? He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Always, if you can err on the side of giving, do it, right? If you can err on the side of healing, go for it. People have asked me, should I pray for that person's healing, whoever it is? And I say, absolutely. Because you're not guaranteed if it's going to work or not, or if God's going to do what you think he's going to do, but you should always just go for it. 
just always offer healing. I always do that. I always pray for healing. Because one way or another, with Jesus, he's going to heal you. Whether in this life or after that you cross through the veil, he's going to heal you. He's, he's always healing and restoring and re- resurrecting. But we can't be the judge and jury on other people. As Jesus says, be merciful as our Father is merciful. Only the Father is the judge, not you and me. So we don't know the hearts of men and women. Only he does. Only he knows what's perfect. And he's perfect in all of his ways. All you and I can really do is bring people to Jesus and let him heal them. He is the ultimate healer because you and I aren't God. We are called to love and serve without discrimination and to do so with the love of God in our hearts and trust God for the results. And in Luke 17, Jesus heals 10 lepers. Not all of them say thank you. Jesus heals without discrimination, without judgment, without any promise of them reciprocating it at all. But only one man returns to thank him. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Samaria, a place they did no good Jew would go to, and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him, keeping their distance, their lepers. They called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Samaritan was like a half-breed, half-Jew, half-Gentile. When Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was one of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. So there's two points I'm going to make. The first is that, well, this this account was a real teaching moment for Jesus. He's he's leveraging this to obviously to bless these ten men, but also to, to teach his disciples some very important points. The first is that Jesus is making it clear that all people can receive healing from God, especially Gentiles. And secondly, to give praise where it's due. All people deserve healing. Give praise where it's due. So all people deserve healing. So when Jesus heals people in the New Testament, it's not magic. He's not upgrading them. He is restoring them to the state that we all should be in before the fall happened. He is elevating them back to the place before sin and death entered the equation. So he's restoring and healing them because that's always what God does. Now, why does Jesus ask them to go to the priests in the temple? There's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that Jesus always perfectly fulfilled the law of Moses every single time. And if you read Leviticus 13 and 14, he's satisfying the requirements of the law that in order for these men to re-enter society as lepers, they have to be inspected by a priest. So that is what uh, Jesus is doing. He also knows he's being watched by other religious leaders who are waiting for him to fail. And so he knows that I will continue to fulfill the law and they will leave me alone. So he's obviously wise in that way. And secondly, and lastly, these men needed to re-enter society. They needed to have employment again and reconnect with their families again. So that's another reason for that, go see the priests. And as Jesus is following the law perfectly... These barriers between these races come down. They get eradicated. You know, suffering has a great way of bringing people together. Here's what I mean. You've got ten lepers, nine of whom are Jews. We can presume they're Jews. And the the last, who Jesus says is a foreigner, a Samaritan. So we know we have one foreigner, nine Jews. Well, usually Jews don't hang out with Samaritans, but their leprosy said, hey, let's be brothers. Let's hang out and have a club, unfortunately, that we're all a member of. And you can presume all of that, that their leprosy temporarily took away their racism for a little while. It's sort of like the idea there's no atheists in foxholes. People become real believer in God when they're fighting in a war. So after these, nine, these ten are healed, though, nine of them, uh, they realize this tenth man is not a Jew, he can't come into the temple to be, to be inspected by the priest. You've got to get out of here, Samaritan. So the only man to return to Jesus and say thank you, to offer praise where it's due, 
is this Samaritan. And he goes back to the source of who healed him. He goes back to Jesus' feet. You know, a lot of people today, we, we, may, we may believe in God, we may like God, we may like God's blessings, but we don't really want to lay at his feet. We might not want to, to give praise where it's due. We may want to seek God's hand, but not always his face. We may want God's blessings, but you might not always want God. Like that old country song, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. People may like the idea of Jesus, but you might not be willing to follow him. And some of these lepers may have been like that. We don't know. A lot of people followed Jesus because it was a meal ticket. He could make bread. He could make wine. <laughs> he could produce food out of nothing. And so these crowds began to follow him. And who could blame him? They're suffering. They're poor. Their, their hardships were real. They're disease-ridden. Some of them possessed by demons. And so you have these 10 men who are saying, Jesus, Master, heal us. That's a great prayer. That's a great starting place. Sometimes that's the only prayer I got each day, is just, Jesus, I need you. I need you every single hour, every day. And that's a prayer of desperation. And that's a prayer Jesus immediately hears. And he doesn't even say, hey, what's up? How are you feeling today? He immediately says, go toward the temple and go, go to see the priest. He doesn't even say, I'm going to heal you. But as these men go and they are obedient to his instruction, the healing comes. And so Jesus heals all of them, knowing that some of them will reject his healing. Some of them will be ungrateful. It's an interesting interplay of the sovereignty and the love and the mercy and grace of God and human will and choice. And that tension of those two things, I don't fully understand but what I do know is that God is good, even when we're not. That God is generous, even when all we want to do is take. He's overabundant all the time. That Jesus is always in control. He's never in a hurry. He didn't have an, an eye watch or a sand dial, a sundial or whatever they could have had back then. He was never checking the sundial to see if we were done talking. You know, he was always in control. He was always willing to help. He gives opportunity to know God's blessings, but Jesus also gives an opportunity to you and I to reject the one who gave you the blessing. See, without choice, there's no love. You and I can choose to love Jesus or not, to worship him or not. And Jesus still loves you. He's still present with you, even when we sin. So Jesus' action of healing toward these 10 men, it offers them a choice. One of them chose correctly. Nine didn't. The Bible says to come to Jesus as you are, not when you have it all together. Is anybody here today have it all together? Don't lie in church. I don't know. None of us got it all together. Come to him as you are. Do it by faith, not by feelings. But when you and I have been healed by Jesus, what will we do with it? Will we walk away and say, man, I feel great? Or will we remember the one who gave you the blessing to begin with? You know, as I was saying, like Jesus, when these lepers call out and go, help us, help us, heal us, Jesus doesn't go, hey, how are you feeling? Uh, I made this mistake before when I led church services. You, you, unintentionally, I would say, how's everybody feeling today? You heard this? How are you feeling? And I've, I don't do that anymore. Because sometimes when I've heard people in church services say that, I'm like, I feel rotten. I feel terrible. I feel overwhelmed. I feel anxious. I'm barely ambulatory at 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Don't ask me how I feel. How do I feel? That's the most 21st century postmodern question you could ever ask. We're just driven by feelings. How do you feel today? My feelings are up and down, just like yours. They come and they go. I don't want to talk about how I feel before I sing to God. I want to know things about God. I want to know the truth and the, the security of God's word. I'm overwhelmed by the violence and the drama of this world. 
I don't want to sing songs about how I feel. I want to sing songs about God and his goodness and his mercy to me, even when people may reject his blessing. Ask me about truth that can deal with my soul. Don't talk to me about how I feel. I barely got here on time. I spilled my coffee. My kid forgot it sh- his shoe. Right? What I need to be reminded of is that the truths of God's word have a direct encounter with the risen Jesus. And out of that can come my feelings and fuel my heart and my emotions to be reminded that you and I are ransomed and redeemed and healed, that you and I are no different than those 10 lepers that are in this story, that we are all born with a spiritual leprosy that only he can heal ultimately, that we freely serve a savior who heals those who ask regardless if they return the favor. Now, if you, if you get on that side of it and talk about the grace of God, now we got something to sing about, right? Now we have a reason to worship. Now we have a reason to lead our praise, to let our worship be passionate and effusive and all with all of our hearts because it's rooted in God's promise, not my feelings. Your, my feelings will betray me. More people today have been led astray by that, that 21st century idea of follow your heart. What does that even mean? I mean, Follow your heart? You're essentially saying, God, I'll do it by myself. You're asking for problems. We, we need to be reminded that this one man, he returned to thank Jesus, and he laid at his feet. And I have to wonder, what did his worship look like after that day? Do you think he stood in, they didn't have church, but you know, do you think he stood in church and was just sort of like, oh, is that a new song? It's good. Do you really think that's what his worship was like? He had leprosy. No one wanted to be with him. He had no money and no family. He had nothing, and Jesus gave him back everything. Do you think his worship was polite and wanted to be seen by others? Are you kidding me? His worship was through the roof because it was rooted in what Jesus had done for him. And nothing was going to take that away from that guy. You and I are the same today, friends, that Jesus offers healing to all people this day and every day. That our praise is not dependent on our feelings, on our circumstance, that when we worship We are not just singing a song to a preacher or a band. You're worshiping Almighty God. That the gates of heaven are open. Jesus has opened the way to the Father. There is free access to the throne room of God. That through the shed blood of Christ on the cross, we can come boldly before his throne. And yet, don't stand and golf clap. We have been set free, friends. We have been redeemed by his blood for eternity. This is the best news you could ever have, to have direct access to the Father, that to receive healing, don't receive healing from Jesus and walk away. Don't do that. Because you're missing out on knowing the one who healed you. Don't take from God and fail to give him praise. Don't shut the door that he opened I would say rebuke the devil in Jesus' name and stand up and shout his praise. That for he has healed you, he has called you by name. That you and I have failed at other things in this life, but do not fail at this one. This is the most important thing you'll ever do. I tell my children this, that the most important decisions you'll ever make, there's two. The, se- the second most important is who will you marry if you do marry someone one day? The first is what will you do with the person of Jesus Christ? It's the most important decision you'll ever make. Everything hinges on that decision, that Christ has redeemed you. He has made a way in your life 
where there was no way. It was impossible for us to be made right with God, to have peace with God. That, those lepers, they're in the same boat. It was impossible for them to have any p- potential future, and yet Jesus healed them. And that when we worship him, it is for our good. God doesn't need our worship, but he's the center and source of all things that are good in this world and in the whole universe that we need to worship God. We need to be reminded of his goodness. We are the ones who stray and walk away and forget and get confused. So when you're called to worship, give it all you got. Give it all you got. Because when we draw near to God, he draws near to us. Zechariah, Zephaniah reminds us that, that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. The Holy Spirit is not invisible. He's just unseen. He is present with his people in worship. So friends, let us continue to worship together while I pray. God, indeed, we all stand as people in need of grace. None of us in the room have leprosy. But I pray we do remind the Lord we're in need of spiritual healing. That as you walk by on that dusty road, we should be the same. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Heal us. Restore us, redeem us. Thank you, Jesus, that you will, that you love us, that you are merciful and abundant in your grace. And I pray for the healing presence of Jesus to flow across this room. I pray for the Spirit of God to blow like a wind and to heal souls that are desperately in need of restoration. And I pray that your spirit would blow across those that are present with us at home, that they would worship you, that we would all be of one accord, one mind of saying, Lord, we need your healing every day. We're no different than those lepers. We're no better. Lord, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven right now. Everyone in heaven doesn't have leprosy. Everyone in heaven doesn't struggle with addiction and depression and anxiety. You desire for healing on the earth as it is in heaven. So may your will be done in this place. And may all those gathered here know that they can be restored and made right with you by trusting in in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ.